Howdy, folks. Thanks for checking in to Mr. Ulrich's Land of Biology. I am Mr. Ulrich. I am also dealing with a rather fabulous sinus infection, so sorry about the nasally voice. Uh, anyway, this is uh, Cell Tour Part 2. Uh, in the previous video, Part 1, we uh, introduced the cell itself, the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and how that difference really lies mostly on uh, the presence of membrane-bound organelles. We talked about the endomembrane system. In this, we're going to kind of move from the endomembrane system into some of the other membrane-bound organelles within the cell. In the last video, we talked about how cells like us have to work to live and that they have these jobs that they have to take care of, basic jobs, uh, making proteins, using energy, and making more cells. Uh, last video, we spent quite a bit of time talking about how proteins are made and processed and uh, kind of sent through the endomembrane system in order for secretion. Uh, today, we're going to kind of finish with uh, protein construction and uh, what some of those proteins will do. In the next video, we'll talk about uh, the use of energy. We'll get into making more cells when we start talking about reproduction uh, and mitosis. In order for cells to be able to carry out metabolic processes like protein synthesis, they're going to need a supply of raw materials from food. Uh, they're going to need a place to put the waste products from those processes, as well as have adequate amounts of water uh, to supply the solvent for those chemical reactions to take place. In eukaryotes, it's the job of the vacuole to do all of these things, all of the storage. In plant cells, they're going to have one big, huge central storage vacuole. We call it a tonoplast. Um, in freshwater protists like this paramecium here, they will use uh, vacuoles. We call them contractile vacuoles. Uh, the problem is uh, if you're a freshwater protist in a hypotonic freshwater solution, water is diffusing into the cell, uh, and that's going to cause the cell to swell up. And... Uh, the paramecium doesn't want to blow up, and so it has these uh, contractile vacuoles. I'm trying to get my pointer here. Uh, it has these contractile vacuoles here uh, that, as water diffuses from the cytoplasm into the uh, contractile vacuole, the contractile vacuole expands and expands and expands, uh, reaches a critical size, and the cytoskeleton kind of kicks in and starts to uh, compress down on that vacuole. If you notice, there are these little... Uh, tubes that extend away from the contractile vacuole, uh, these actually will reach all the way to the cell membrane, and then uh, as the contractile vacuole contracts, uh, it squeezes the water out. Uh, in uh, heterotrophs like animal cells, uh, they're going to form food vacuoles through this process of phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is an endocytotic process that moves material in. And in this case, uh, phagocytosis, we're talking about large uh, chunks of food. Uh, and so uh, the, the cell membrane streams uh, and the cytoplasm streams around the uh, food particle, and then it pinches off and squeezes the uh, uh, cell membrane together, forming a one, uh, forming a, a food vacuole, a little vesicle here. Uh, again, if this diagram looks somewhat familiar, it really should, uh, because it's the endomembrane system that we talked about in the last video. And here again, here are some little vesicles. We don't really call them vacuoles, uh, but these are the same kind of idea. It's a bag uh, formed from a membrane, cell membrane. Uh, these uh, transport vesicles then go to the gold apparatus uh, once the secretory vesicle is created uh, that's going to go through the reverse of uh, endocytosis and go through exocytosis uh, and actually secrete those proteins into the environment let's take a couple moments here to codify some of the important points that we've just been talking about when it comes to these vacuoles and vesicles so they are really to store stuff uh, and allow material to move from one place to another uh, in the case of food vacuoles, they are formed through phagocytosis. Uh, they are eventually going to fuse with the lysosomes, which we'll talk about here in a second. The contractile vacuoles in the freshwater protists pump the excess water out of the cell. The central vacuoles in plants, well, let's take a minute to talk more about these. Let's take some more time to talk about those vacuoles in plants and the function thereof. Uh, its function is storage. 
what's going to happen as a result of some of the stuff that it's stored and how it's stored is going to give it a different function. But we'll get to that in a second. Um, so yeah, so this is where the plant is stockpiling lots of different proteins, such as uh, pigments um, and inorganic ions, uh, salt ions, all kinds of other fun stuff in there. Uh, a lot of these are going to come from metabolic byproducts, uh, but water is another metabolic byproduct, and that gets in there too. Uh, so pigments get stored in there, like I said. Uh, other stuff like uh, uh, defensive compounds. So plants don't want to be eaten. Uh, and uh, one way that they prevent this from happening is by making toxic compounds like nicotine. Uh, the nicotine in uh, tobacco plants actually made in roots, but it is stored in the leaves in the uh, central storage vacuole. So that when a uh, herbivore comes by, um, eats the uh, tobacco plant, uh, it is actually poisoned by the nicotine and uh, made so that it does not want to make it, eat any more uh, tobacco plants. Now, because of all of this stuff being stored in the central storage vacuole, it's going to make that vacuole have, we call that a cell sap sometimes, uh, but it's going to make that have a, a lot of dissolved material. It's going to make it hypertonic, which of course means that uh, water, again, is going to tend to diffuse from the cytoplasm into the vacuole. And this pressure builds up, and that's why really we call it a tonoplast, because tono uh, has to do with pressure. Uh, that causes the cell to kind of plump up. We're putting pressure on the uh, inside of the cell wall itself. And it's actually this plumpness that holds up uh, herbaceous stemmed plants like celery. Uh, uh, trees are held up by lignin by thick, thick uh, cell walls. But when we get into herbaceous plants, uh, it's really all of this, this uh, water pressure building up inside of the cell. When you bite into celery, the satisfying <laughs> crunch that you hear, it's actually the sound of all of those central storage vacuoles, all those cells blowing up because they have all that pressure built up within them. Uh, it is a selective membrane, and so that is just like uh, the cell membrane, and that's what's going to allow uh, some material to be held in there while still allowing the water to flow in to go through that membrane. Lysosomes are a kind of specialized vesicle or vacuole uh, in that they contain, as the little stomachs of the cell, they contain digestive enzymes. So just like your stomach is where proteins are broken down, uh, the lysosomes are where proteins, among other things, are bro broken down because they contain those digestive enzymes. In doing so, they are the cleanup crew of the cell. So as uh, uh, cell organelles start to wear out and break down and accumulate uh, mistakes and problems, uh, these lysosomes can kind of come around and hoover them up and digest them and return those things back to the cell uh, cytoplasm to be used as raw materials. All right. Uh, like I said, it is a little bag of digestive enzymes. Uh, we mentioned them briefly in uh, our discussion of the endo, uh, endo uh, membrane system, <laughs> sorry, uh, in that they are synthesized in the rough endoplasmic reticulum and transferred to the Golgi apparatus uh, where they uh, pinch off. Uh, and instead of becoming uh, pinch off into a secretory vesicle, they pinch off into lysosomes. So they don't have the tags on them uh, that tell the cytoskeleton to bring those uh, vesicles to the cell membrane, uh, like the secretory vesicles. Lysosomes were first uh, discovered by Christian de Duve back in the 60s. Uh, he was investigating white blood cells and how they can actually do the job that they do by uh, in that they de destroy the invaders. And he found that it was these lysosomes that are actually doing the, doing the dirty work. Let's go back to the endomembrane system here uh, to see how these uh, lysosomes actually work. Uh, remember, all of these structures are uh, bounded by cell membranes. And cell membranes, those individual uh, uh, phospholipids are not bonded together. The proteins are not bonded together. Uh, and so that allows them, like bubbles, to pinch into two or to uh, fuse together into one. And in this case, this is how lysosomes actually work uh, to digest food within food vacuoles. Uh, the uh, get my pointer here. The food vacuole here that we've already seen form is going to come down and actually join with a lysosome and form a 
phagolysosome, uh, and mix the food bits with the uh, whatever the uh, the digestive enzymes, uh, and, and those polymers then are broken down into monomers, and the monomers pass into the cytosol and are used as raw materials for other uh, metabolic processes. Uh, lyso, the word lyso comes from breaking things apart. Lysol works by breaking apart the uh, cell membrane, cell walls of uh, bacteria. And some is from soma, uh, which is uh, structure or body. As the little stomachs of the cell, lysosomes contain enzymes. And just like the enzymes, uh, digestive enzymes in your stomach, uh, lysosome enzymes also work at low pHs. Uh, in order to do this, of course, the organelle has to have some way of creating this low pH environment within the inside of the cell. It does this by having uh, embedded proteins, transport proteins through that membrane that actually pump uh, protons, pump hydrogen ions from the cytosol into the lysosome. If you remember, pH is a member of, uh, as a member, <laughs> pH is a measure of the uh, ratio of H's to OH's, and if we jack up the number of H's, then we get a low pH, we get an acidic environment. Now, why do they do this? Well, enzymes are proteins, and pH affects the structure. Uh, so in order for the proteins to have the right shape to do their digestive job, they have to have the right shape, uh, and they can only achieve that shape at a low pH. What is the uh, evolutionary or adaptive benefit of having these enzymes only work at a low pH? Well, it's the same as the benefit of having your digestive enzymes work at only a low pH. If you get a, uh, an ulcer, and a uh, peptic ulcer, and you start to leak digestive juices uh, from your stomach into your body cavity, there's a whole host of problems, but one of them uh, could be that your enzymes would start to digest you. Uh, in order to keep this from happening, your uh, uh, protein digestive enzymes only work at a low pH, and your body cavity has a neutral to basic pH, and so those proteins, when they leak out, pop it into an inactive form of pepsinogen and don't start to digest you. Same thing happens in the uh, with the lysosomes. If some of the lysosomal uh, enzymes leak out into the cytoplasm, it's not going to digest the cytoplasm. Now, these things can go wrong. There's a lot of places uh, where this can uh, fail. And a lot of times uh, when we're talking about lysosomes and problems with lysosomes, these diseases are fatal. Uh, because without digestive enzymes working, uh, their cells are able to accumulate material, but they can't digest them. And without being able to digest them, they can't turn them into waste products, which are then excreted. Uh, and because of that, then the lysosomes start to fill up with undigested material, uh, and you start to accumulate problems. The cells get to grow larger and larger and larger, or the lysosomes grow larger and larger, and then that keeps the cells from being able to do their job, and then the organs uh, can't do their job as well because the cells aren't doing their job. Uh, there are several different lysosomal storage diseases. Uh, one of them is called uh, Tay-Sachs disease, and this is when uh, this is an accumulation of undigested fat molecules uh, with within brain cells. Uh, as they get larger, they disrupt the function of the brain cells themselves. Uh, there are several other lysosomal storage diseases. Uh, I put these up not because you're necessarily going to be quizzed on the difference between Gaucher's disease and Farber disease, uh, but really so that we can see that lysosomes are involved in breaking down lots of things, lipids, polysaccharides, proteins, all of our major uh, nutrient groups. And uh, without the ability to process these, uh, you don't have the raw materials, and uh, these cause uh, major, major problems. Yes, malfunctions of the lysosomes will cause some cells to die um, when they shouldn't be dying. But there are times when some cells do actually need to die, and the lysosomes are largely the uh, mechanism by which this programmed cell death can take place. Uh, the lysosomes all break open. And, and, and kill the cell. Now, you might be saying, but we just talked about how if the digestive enzymes leak out, then the up higher pH environment changes them. If all of the lysosomes break open, 
that runs the risk of changing the pH of the entire cell. Uh, and uh, those digestive enzymes can still do their job and still break all those things down. Now, when do we need to do this? As organisms develop, some structures develop and then need to go away to make room for uh, the next stage of development. Uh, tadpoles are a good example of this. That tail has to go away, has to be reabsorbed. They don't just cut the tail off. That would be a waste. Uh, through apoptosis, all of the material that um, that the organism has invested, all the energy the organism has invested into those cellular structures, some of it can be kind of uh, 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 retaken up. It's not lost. If I just uh, cut my tail off and leave it, that's a whole lot of energy, a whole lot of time, space, money, and effort that I invested in that uh, structure, which I'm not getting back. If I just go through this uh, program cell death, I can get that material back. Uh, it's not just frogs. Uh, we were born with, uh, uh, when we just had leg buds uh, and arm buds, uh, there, our fingers were all fused together. This is obviously before we were born. Uh, our fingers were all fused together and our toes fused together. And these structures need to uh, break down the cells in there and need to uh, go away so that we can have free wiggly fingers. This process of programmed cell death is called apoptosis. Uh, apoptosis is uh, really important so that cells can grow at the right rate and be replaced at the right rate. Uh, if uh, a cell does not uh, go through this self-destruct process and continues to do its thing, um, it will be replaced by other cells without being lost. Uh, and so uh, when cells just keep dividing, keep dividing, keep dividing, we call this cancer. All right, so cancer is the failure of apoptosis, and it can happen through a variety of different cellular mechanisms. This uh, uh, control of the cell cycle uh, has a lot, of, a lot of different parts, and so there's a lot of places where it can go wrong. As we talk more about uh, cell division and reproduction, we'll talk more about cancer. So here again is an embryo at six weeks. Uh, we go a little bit further up and we'll see the embryo nine weeks later and we can see that the uh, cells there between the fingers have started to break down. Uh, even the cells between the toes have started to break down and we're getting some uh, individual toes and individual fingers. Uh, there sometimes are problems with this process uh, and people can develop uh, webbed toes and webbed fingers and it, it's not like uh, your uh, webbed toes start to look like Aquaman or something. Uh, really what it is, is it's just the failure of the uh, limbs to, uh, excuse me, not limbs, it's the failure of the digits to separate here on uh, this line here. So it looks like it's on a stalk more than it is uh, uh, webbed. Uh, and we can see it between the fingers here as well. Uh, we call this syndactyly, and it's easily cured, uh, easily, I shouldn't say cured, but easily addressed through a uh, simple surgical procedure. The last membrane-bound structure that we need to talk about are peroxisomes. Um, these are kind of the other digestive enzyme sacs. Uh, we find these in both plants and animals and protists and funguses. Uh, their major job is to break down fatty acids into sugars so that those sugars can be moved around a little easier and uh, be used as an energy source. Uh, these are also going to wander around and uh, detoxify the cell. So they're going to pick up uh, dangerous compounds uh, and modify them so that they're not so dangerous anymore. Things like alcohol uh, and other poisons uh, are detoxified in peroxisomes. Uh, they also produce uh, hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is going to break down, uh, and as that breaks down, it produces uh, uh, free radicals, which aren't so nice, and so they need to be dealt with. I, I hope you chemists can look at that uh, chemical equation there and recognize that that is uh, rather unbalanced. Well, there you have it more of those membranous organelles that are making us different from our prokaryotic cousins. If you have any further questions, please feel free. Drop me an email there at the address on the screen. Uh, always go to Mr. Ulrich's land of biology.com. See if there's any other information there that you need. Uh, keep questioning, young questers, and we'll see you in class.